How y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Okay, I'm trying to remember who was here last week. Yeah, they're like, I don't know. That was like seven days ago. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that those who weren't are back again. By the way, if you missed, um, I would advise you go. I need to get on the website. I need to make the link easier to find on the website. But go and watch uh, last week. I think we got some good information and interesting stuff on the different uh, contradictions. So what we are doing, if you hadn't picked up on it, is in celebration of Easter, we are going to be showing that the Bible is indeed reliable and true and that the attacks of critics that come against it fail quite often. Personally, I think every time, but a lot of them are surely, uh, some of them border on the silly. And I said to, to, to be sure that I'm not just kind of picking some um, oddball thoughts here and there, that, that I went to some of the bigger sources that are places that critics of Christianity would be getting their material. That's where they go to learn things. One of them was a website called infidels.org, um, where it just lists a ton of supposed problems with the Bible. Um, and, and it is one of the biggest websites that atheists and skeptics and critics of the Bible visit. Another one is a scholar named Bart Ehrman, Dr. Bart Ehrman. He is a, uh, a professor of textual criticism. That, that's to study the actual manuscripts, to go back and look at the, 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 the old copies that we have. And then that's his area. But he is a big critic of the Bible. And uh, we played a little video. It puttered out somewhere in the middle, but you can get it on, uh, on, the, on the video that I put up on the website. It's actually on there. So... Um, but he, but he, lives, he rattles off like 11 or 12 supposed contradictions in the Easter story. And so here we are, Easter time. Uh, one of my favorite things to deal with is Bible contradictions. And so I thought it would be fun uh, and informative to look at some of the things that critics of the Bible, of Christianity, point at and say, aha, looky here, your Bible is wrong. And then to show why actually they are the ones who are wrong. Um, and it gives me a good excuse for my fabulous uh, graphic design skills. Um, if you can't see from there, it's uh, the empty tomb, but then right outside of it, there's a sign where the top sign says, you know, curve left, and then the b bottom sign says keep right. So it's like, wait a minute, which is it, left or right? But, yeah, there you go. And that is actually part of the clever irony of the picture is it looks like a contradiction, but it's not. See? Clever. Right. All right. Alleged Bible Contradictions, Easter edition. We're going to cover things that deal with the trials. Uh, we're going to wrap up. We dealt mostly with the trials last week. We're going to look at some more that have to deal with the trials. And then uh, we'll get into some claims of errors with the crucifixion. But first, I want to point out, just to let you know, people are watching and paying attention and commenting. Uh, this guy, uh, this is actually a screenshot. Uh, I'll give you the full thing. You have to try to read that. Um, <clears throat> he is, um, the series we did a little while back, the um, How to Make Trouble in Church, where I had the video of the guy. He, he commented on our Facebook thing saying um, this, where he said, almost all supposed contradictions, now, th this is how, you know, the, their kind of way of thinking, how they're approaching this. Almost all supposed contradictions can be harmonized by saying, but the Bible doesn't say X, and where you fill in X for whatever the problem is. So, for example, Matthew says that two women went to the tomb, but it doesn't say that there are, they were the only ones. It says, but what you end up doing is always being additive and expansionary just to make the story fit. And that's what he's going after. You're just trying to make the story fit. All these answers that you're giving, that they're just, that they're just there, that there's all these problems, and you're just trying to squeeze them together to get them to fit into your narrative that you want there to be. And of course, one thing we explained last week is actually the whole point is it already fits. There is no problem at all. And the example I used is if you picture like a leaky boat. Right? They're, they're trying to say, oh, well, you Christians, there's all these problems with your Bible, and you're running around trying to plug the holes. No, no, what, what we're doing is we're showing there are no holes. 
So whenever we give these uh, responses to these alleged contradictions, we're not running around trying to solve problems. What we're saying is it's not a problem anyway. And so that is just a thought as we launch into it. But before we get in the thick of it, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we ask that as we examine these supposed problems with your word, God, that you would help us to see the truth of the matter, that you would open our hearts and our minds to understand. God, that in all things that we do, that we are glorifying you, that as we look at the scripture to test and see if it really is error-free, if it really is reliable, that God, that we can see, see it for what it is. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay. Now, what I want to try to do, um, last time I think I got a little preachy, uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can get some of your help to um, address some of these issues. But let me just to show you how the, the, this idea that you know, it, it's not really a problem, right? that, they, that they're trying to say there's a problem where one doesn't exist. We talked about last week this idea of um, Herod, right? That, that, that um, did Jesus actually get questioned by Herod? Because Luke, I believe it is, Luke is the only one that says there was Herod, right? Luke says that uh, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, right? He says, you're a Galilean. You're not my jurisdiction. Go to Herod. So he went to Herod and Herod questioned him and then sent him back. And according to this, it says that um, Luke says it, and Matthew, Mark, and John make no mention of Herod. Now, what's interesting is this atheist that says this points out, this by itself means nothing, and he's right. It means nothing. Just because the other three don't mention it doesn't mean it didn't happen. All four Gospels have material, have events, have things that they account for that the other three don't. Right? It's nice whenever you have multiple attesting accounts, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. However, his point is going to be, it brings about another contradiction. And this is the contradiction he thinks it brings about. Who put the robe on Jesus? Because according to Matthew, Mark, and John, it says that after Pilate, uh, that Pilate had Jesus scourged and turned over to his soldiers to be crucified, and the soldiers placed the robe on on Jesus, that Pilate's soldiers put the robe on Jesus. But according to Luke, in contradiction to Matthew, Mark, and John, he says that the robe was placed on Jesus much earlier by Herod and his soldiers. Luke mentions no crown of thorns, by the way. Matthew, Mark, and John mention the crown of thorns. Luke doesn't. So, uh-oh. So who was it? Who put the robe on Jesus? Was it Pilate's soldiers or was it Herod's soldiers? What was that? Both. Both. I mean, I'm not really sure why this is considered, right? This is one of those things where I'm showing you. There's no problem. Okay, so completely plausible, reasonable understanding is that he goes to Herod. Herod's soldiers, oh, you're a king, ha ha, you know, throws a robe on him and mocks him and then sends him back to Pilate. Maybe with the robe. Maybe the soldiers at Pilate's hear what the soldiers at Herod's did, and they thought it was funny, so they did it too. Maybe it was the same robe. But the point is that there's no need to think that there's any contradiction here at all. Right, so, so, so they're mocking Jesus. They throw this robe on him. He gets sent back to Pilate. He already has a robe on, so they're mocking him. Right? They take the robe off. They beat him some more and throw the robe on and mock him some more. I mean, there's, there's nothing here that needs to say, Aha, look, 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 it's an error. It's an error. It can't both be true. Actually, it's both true very easily. So, good one there, gold star for Jake. Um, what had Barabbas done? Now, this is one of those instances where knowing a little bit more helps out. Okay? Um, according to uh, infidels.org, according to our atheist uh, skeptic critic here, that Mark and Luke say that Barabbas was guilty of insurrection and murder. But John says that Barabbas was a robber. So which was it? Was he a robber? Or was he an insurrectionist and a murderer? 
Probably all of the above would be a really good um, thing. Now, here's the deal. This is, this is where knowing a little bit more, dig in, kind of find some stuff out, can help. The word that is translated as robber, okay, it is not the same word that you would think of as that we think of robber, like a thief, someone who steals things. Right? The word for thief is kleptus, like klepto, kleptomaniac, right? That's, that's where we get that from. This is someone who is sneaky, stealthy, right? Pickpocket, come in while you're not home, right? embezzlement, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's thief. The word that is used for Barabbas to describe him as a robber is the Greek word lestis. And I haven't taken Greek, so I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. But that implies a violent criminal, violent offender. This is someone who pillages and plunders and uses violence to get what they want and to, um, I mean, it is a violent criminal, Okay. So different translations, by the way, that word robber, because you see robber, you think thief. The different ways that several places translate it. Um, one says it translated it as brigand, it's translated as troublemaker, outlaw, rebel, terrorist. There's actually a couple that translate it as terrorist. Uh, some say bandit. Uh, some uh, translate it as saying that he took part in an uprising. Um, he's called a freedom fighter in some translations, and in one of the most numerous, it is translated not as robber, but as revolutionary. All of which fits in with what the other Gospels describe. He's an insurrectionist and a murderer. Th this word robber actually um, describes a category of criminal that insurrectionist and murderer fits in very well. So there you go. Sometimes all it takes is just a little bit of understanding. You know, because sometimes, and this is one thing you'll notice um, if you deal with critics too much, sometimes they'll even hand pick a translation that fits the point they're wanting to make. I, I've seen people where they say, oh, well, this over here, and they'll take like the ESV, they'll say, this contradicts this verse over here, and they'll take the, you know, King James. It's like, well, now wait a minute, okay, because those translators are using completely different ideas, maybe even different manuscripts, you know, it, to go from. You, you cannot, you know, they, they handpick a translation that fits the point they're wanting to make. It's like, no, no, you need to understand what's being trying to be communicated there. And so sometimes it does take a little bit extra effort and digging in, but again, we see there is no problem. All right, get into the crucifixion. What time did Jesus die? When was Jesus crucified? Well, uh, according to Mark, he was, um, says now it was the third hour and they crucified him. But according to John, it says it was about the sixth hour. And Pilate said to the Jews, behold your king. And then he was carried off to be crucified. Now, the way they reckon time under Jewish reckoning, uh, they start at sunrise which is about six o'clock. Actually, this time of year, I mean, we're right here, Easter, Passover, you know, that's all right there together, which is this immediate time of year. Uh, sunrise this morning in Israel was 6.09. So six o'clock, beginning of the day, and then they count hours from there. And so you have uh, Mark is saying that uh, he was crucified at 9 a.m. But John is saying that he was crucified at noon. So which one? Is it? Hmm. Appears to be a contradiction uh, until you read a little bit. Jewish time and Roman time were reckoned differently. They, they, they were, they, uh, Roman time measured the way we do, midnight. Jews counted from sun up. We, uh, Romans counted from midnight. So Mark is using uh, Jewish time and John is using Roman time. Okay. So whenever Mark says it was the third hour, he means about 9 a.m. The third hour from sunrise, 6 o'clock plus 3 is 9. Okay, so John says it was the sixth hour. Okay, but midnight plus 6, well, that's 6 o'clock. We've still got a problem. There's still three hours kind of missing there. Well, but that's where you stop and you take a look at what was actually said. 
because John doesn't actually say that that is when Jesus was crucified. He says that's whenever Pilate turned him over to be crucified. Do you think that right then and there, that minute, they threw him on a piece of wood and nailed him down? No. Some time passed. Actually, we have several things where time passes. Um, <clears throat> so Mark is saying that he was crucified. Mark actually says, and they crucified him at the third hour. So we have some other things that go on. In Mark and in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Matthew, they both record that after Pilate turns Jesus over to be crucified, the soldiers take him and beat him and mock him some more. Okay, well, there's some time they're spending doing, you know, who knows how long they're having some fun beating and whipping and mocking Jesus. And then we also know that he's crucified with two other people. So they're getting them, you know, ready and doing whatever they're doing with them. And then he has to carry his cross from where the palace where they're at out to the place where he's going to be crucified, which is about, best I could figure, about a third of a mile, which is not a long distance, but it's also not a very fast walk, especially after Jesus has been beaten the way he had. And then once they get there, then they actually got to make the preparations to, you know, make, get, get them and nail them down and everything. So this is not a just quick and easy. So whenever at about 6 a.m., and remember, these are not firm times. They're not sitting there counting clock, you know, seconds on their clock like we do. So whenever they say, it was the third hour, well, it was somewhere in the general area of the third hour. So sometime about six or shortly after, Pilate says, take him away. Then they beat him, they mock him, they get the other prisoners, they march him out there, and you have three hours worth of time, roundabouts more or less, whenever Pilate says, go crucify him, and then when they actually nail him to the cross. So John is saying, this is when Pilate turned him over, and Mark is saying this is when it happened. No contradiction. It all actually perfectly fits with the timeline of what Scripture is laying out. <sighs> Make sense? We good? Thoughts, questions? Y'all know if you let me, I might just roll through. I'm trying not to do that. Okay, well now this brings up another interesting question. Who carried the cross? I mean, because according to John, Jesus carried the cross, John 19, 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. However, Mark and Matthew and Luke all say that uh, they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. So which was it? Did Jesus carry it? Or did this guy Simon carry it? Both. A again, this is one of those things where it doesn't take a lot of effort to stop and think, no, wait a minute. Okay, Jesus left carrying his cross was unable to bear it because he'd been up all night and beaten and scourged and mocked and I mean everything for several hours now. He's a little weak. And so they grab someone and say, here, help him carry it. I, I mean, that, that, that's a, that's a non-thing. And actually, okay, so, you know, so who carried it? Well, maybe they actually took it off Jesus and put it on this Simon guy. Or maybe if you've seen Passion of the Christ, I think the way they do it is that they both carry it because it's like tied to Jesus. And so Simon has to like get under him and you know, they both walk and carry it. Either way, there's no reason to think this is a contradiction. It is no problem at all. But we get an added bonus because what's interesting is they mention that it was carried by Simon the uh, Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Who is Alexander and Rufus, and why does Mark mention that? Hmm. Interesting. This is what is called an undesigned coincidence. We've talked about these before, where there's just trivial little details that are dropped into the story that whenever you take this story over here and this story over here, they just interlock. Nice and neat and fill in details of the other. And this is a hallmark of writings by people who were actually there and actually knew some details. 
if you're making this up years later, these kind of things don't happen. This is not a fake. It's not a forgery. And so um, there's something we need to know. In the ancient world, um, names are given um, to kind of let you know, not, not just names, names of relatives, other people, relations are given to let you know who you're talking about. We're talking about Simon. Well, which Simon? There's at least three other Simons in the Bible I can think of off the top of my head. Right? There's Simon Peter, there's Simon the Magician. There, there's another Simon I can't think of right now, but I know I've run into some others. Which Simon are we talking about? Oh, this is the Simon who is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Okay, that lets us know which Simon it is. Okay, but why would that be important? Historians tend to think that Mark was writing in Rome. All the early um, records of you know, Christian church fathers who mention Mark say that he wrote in Rome. He was in Rome with Peter, where Peter, I think, ultimately met his demise, but he got his information from Peter, and he was in Rome. And so as he's writing, he's thinking of things that are going to make sense to his audience who are Roman Christians. So whoever this Alexander and Rufus people are, he expects that his audience in Rome is going to know who that is. That they're going to read that and go, oh, Simon the father, Alexander and Rufus, this was your dad. You know, that they're going to know who he's talking about. Well, what's interesting is you jump over to Romans chapter 16, that long list at the end where Paul is just saying, say hello to this person, tell that person I said hi, uh, hey, help this person out. And it's kind of boring and you just like skip right past it. Don't skip past that stuff. That's where the fun stuff is located. He mentions um, Romans uh, 16, 13. He says, greet Rufus, chosen of the Lord and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Well, now here's another Rufus, possibly the same Rufus. It, he's writing to the Romans. He's writing to someone in Rome. And he's saying, hey, say hi to Rufus for me. Because, I mean, he, he, he's a great guy and his mom was like a mother to me. While Mark is writing to the church in Rome and saying, hey, this guy Simon was Rufus's dad. Same Rufus? Hmm. Kind of seems to line up. I would actually throw in another one. Uh, this is a maybe. I'm not going to get dogmatic. I'm not going to plant my flag and die on this hill. But what's interesting, Paul says that, um, you know, his mom was like a mom to me. Where has Paul been in one place for any amount of time for anyone's mother to really get close with him? Not very much, except in the book of Acts, we see that Paul and Barnabas spend a year in Antioch being ministered to and trained and taught and teaching and ministering themselves and listed among the people who are there are some men from Cyrene. Cyrene? Hey, that's where Simon's from, who carried the cross, you know, the father of Rufus. And the pieces just kind of seem to fit together. That here, while he was in Antioch, he got to know Rufus's family. And then later, Rufus had gone to Rome, and he's writing, saying, say hi to Rufus. And Mark is saying, hey, this guy Simon was Rufus's dad. I'm not about to get dogmatic and, you know, make a, you know, new denomination built on that or anything, but seems to make sense to me. All right. But that's not what we're here for. That was free of charge. Let's get on to the other fun stuff. An alleged historical contradiction. Our critic from the infidels.org website says that Rome did not crucify robbers. Matthew 27 and Mark 15 say that Jesus was crucified between two robbers. Luke just calls them criminals and John simply calls them men. And he says it is a historical fact that the Romans did not crucify robbers. Crucifixion was reserved for insurrectionist and rebellious slaves. Hmm. Do you remember what the Greek word for robber implies? These aren't common criminals, right? These are violent offenders. Actually, he says that Rome only crucified insurrectionists, as we saw with Barabbas. Insurrectionist fits very well into this description. And so, there we go. Our English translations, while accurate, I mean, you know, he's robbing. He's also pillaging and murdering and, you know, other stuff along the way. But 
the Greek word that we translate as robber, which, okay, that's one definition of it, actually has a deeper, broader meaning that we don't always catch in the English, and it fits perfectly well with the supposed uh, historical error that he thinks the Bible's committing. Clearly, looks to me, no error found. Did both robbers mock Jesus or only one? Mark 15 says, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Matthew 27, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Luke 23, however, says, but one of the robbers answered and said to the other, do you not even fear God seeing that you are under the same condemnation? We indeed justly um, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So what happened? Did they both mock Jesus or did only one mock Jesus? What's the resolution? Both. It's amazing how much that word keeps popping up, right? How long was Jesus on the cross? Several hours. You think maybe there was enough time there for one of the guys to have a change of heart? As he's facing his last moments on earth? Right? The fact that they're mocking Jesus, whenever it says that they reviled him with the same thing, the same thing is people were saying, hey, if you're the Christ, come on down off that cross. You know, aren't you supposed to be the son of God? And so they were mocking him too. They know who he is. And at some point, one of them says, you know what? Man, you need to cut that out. We don't need to be doing this. He, he's innocent. We deserve to be up here. And he repents. That's the picture that's brought. There's no contradiction here. It's a beautiful picture of a guy who faced with his own mortality, comes to his senses and repents and calls on Christ for grace. No contradiction. When was the curtain torn in two? Was it before Jesus died? Because Luke 23 says, And then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. However, um, Mark and Matthew have a different story. They say that, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice and he breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when did it happen? Did it happen before he died, like Luke says, or did it happen after he died, like Matthew and Mark say? Probably after. That seems, I mean, it would seem reasonable, right? How about at the same time? If, if you're recording two events that happen at the same time, how do you do that? You're going to have to describe one after the other. But does the order that you put them in actually imply anything about which one happened first? No, it's just, you know, you got to put them in there. It doesn't really matter. What's that? And how would they even know? I mean, did they have, you know, was it like John had a stopwatch at the cross and Peter had a stopwatch down at the temple and they were like keeping? No. Yeah, yeah, they're like, like okay, he just died. Oh, now it ripped, right? And it, no, 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 no. That's not how this happened, right? They, they, they know that these two events happened together somehow. And another thing we have to remember, and um, well, let me get into this first. This word then, if you look in Matthew and Mark, where it says, then the veil of the temple was torn. That word then, that Greek word um, is kai. I'm guessing is how that's pronounced. This is just a simple conjunction, like and. It actually um, it does not mean an order of events. It most often implies, uh, is translated as and or also. There's nothing here that necessarily means we have to imply this first, then that. They're just saying this happened and that happened. They're not actually saying anything about the order of events. 
And besides, what was I going to say? I was going to say something before I went off on that one. See, I should have stuck with it right there. Don't get off your notes. But that, I mean, but, but you see the point. The, the, oh, the, this doesn't affect anything. And one thing, one problem we often have, and critics use this a lot, is that we will take our 21st century Western mindset thinking of wanting precision and apply that to a first century culture where close enough was accurate enough for them. So was it before? Was it after? I don't think they cared. They were just trying to say these two things happened together. Before, after, the exact precision. I really don't think they had that in mind. <sighs> Jesus' last words. What were the last words of Jesus? Because in Mark 15, it says that the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he dies. But Luke says that when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having this, he breathed his last. However, John says that when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Ooh. Which one is it? All of them. I like that answer. I think how our answers can kind of keep becoming. Like people are trying to look at problems and see problems where no problem exists. Both. All both three of them. There you go. Yeah. It's recording. I mean, Jesus was on the cross for hours. He said lots of things. And I'm sure maybe towards the end, he said several different things. And each author has a point he's wanting to make. And he's selecting, you know, I remember Jesus said this, you know, shortly before he died. And that's what they put in because that's the point they're wanting to make. That's the thing that Jesus said on the cross they're wanting to get across. And so it's not that he didn't say the other two things. And it's not that, like, again, that precision, our minds and our culture, we want that precision. This is exactly, nitpick exactly detail how it happened. They're saying he said this and then he died. Maybe he said something else right before he died. But this was the thing they wanted to get across. Or maybe that's the thing they heard. Point is, there's no reason to think that this would need to be a contradiction. And then if he said one, it means he couldn't have said the others. That's not how we need to look at this. Who buried Jesus? <clears throat> Matthew says that it was Joseph of Arimathea, but apparently Acts says that it was the Jews and the rulers of the Jews who were strangers to Jesus. Acts chapter 13 says, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And, th <clears throat> and though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Who, who's the they? It says that they took him down and laid him in a tomb. In this paragraph, who's the they? It looks like it would refer to those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers. That's who it's talking about. Okay. Well, in the Gospels, we have Joseph of Arimathea, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four record that Joseph of Arimathea uh, took Jesus' body and went and buried it. John actually mentions there's a second person involved there. Who does John say uh, helped? Do you remember who helps Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus? Same guy that came and visited him at night. Got to be born again. Nicodemus. Nicodemus actually helped, according to John, helps Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus. Okay, who is Joseph of Arimathea and who is Nicodemus? 
Well, what are their positions in society? They are members of the Sanhedrin. So they are rulers of the Jews. Well, according to this, it says that the people that are being described here are those who are in Jerusalem. Is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus in Jerusalem? Yes. It says that they are rulers of the Jews. Is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus rulers of the Jews? Yes. Okay, so who buried Jesus? Uh, rulers of the Jews. All right, so there's no contradiction here. What Luke is writing in Acts is exactly what was talked about in the Gospels. No contradiction. Ah, another historical error. Peter and Mary near the cross. Which actually I think it was John and Mary. I don't think it was Peter. But he claims when the gospel writers mention Jesus talking to his mother from the cross, they run afoul of another historical fact, so-called. The Roman soldiers closely guarded places of execution and nobody was allowed near, least of all friends and family who might attempt to help the condemned person. What do you do with that? Ha, Mary couldn't have been at the foot of the cross because the guards wouldn't have let her near. Really? Historical fact, you really know that for sure? No? I mean, give me some sources, give me some information, right? You can't just say it. Show me why you think this is the case and then also show me why you demand that this couldn't have been an exception. Sure, maybe it was unordinary, for them to allow people near the cross? Maybe they got near enough that they could talk, but the guards were still between? There's nothing here that should bring about any kind of uh, tension or angst or idea that there's a historical error in this. This person is pontificating about what could possibly be the case. Saying, no, 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 that couldn't happen. Well, really? I mean, you know for sure that couldn't happen? Just because it rarely happens does not mean it could never happen. There are some out of the ordinary things that take place. And again, it could be the case they were close enough within earshot without actually being physically at the cross with the guards still not letting them right up nearby. I mean, you're on a hill. You can't really get up to them. The guards are there. Maybe you can stand there and talk. Who knows? All right. Another alleged historical error. And then we'll end with this one, see if you've got any questions. According to Matthew 27, at the moment Jesus died, there was an earthquake that opened the tombs and many people were raised from the dead, at which time they went into Jerusalem and were seen by many people. Right? I mean, are you familiar with the resurrection, the crucifixion story? You know that this happened and according to Matthew. But... Here's this guy's claim. He says that here Matthew gets too dramatic for his own good. If many people came back to life and were seen by many people, it must have created quite a stir. Yet Matthew seems to be the only person aware of this happening. Historians of that time certainly know nothing of it, and neither do the gospel writers, the other gospel writers. Well, you know, Matthew's the only one that records it. No one else talks about it. Therefore, it must not have happened. Is that the way that works? No. Now, I think what's going on here is this person has a kind of predisposition against supernatural things. And so because it seems fanciful and ridiculous to him, oh, pff, couldn't possibly have happened. And he's using this idea that, well, Matthew's the only one who records it. Well, there are a lot of things in history that are not questioned that we only have one person recording it. But we still accept. Oh, well, something this big, surely other people would have recorded it. Maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. Right? Maybe it's something they you know, wouldn't even notice. Maybe it's something that did get recorded, but you realize how, just how small a portion of things that we have from that time period? About... 
70% of things that we know were written, we know they were there. We don't have them. They're gone. But they're referenced by other people later on, but we don't actually have those things. We, we know about them. They're referenced, they're quoted, they're mentioned, but we don't actually have those writings. The majority of writings from that time period are just lost. Maybe somebody else did write about it, and it didn't survive. Either way, this isn't something that I go, aha, historical error. No, it's a point that doesn't fit with this person's worldview, and so they find it easy to dismiss. Okay. That's all I had for this week. There was actually one other, and I'll go ahead and admit that um, it, it looked like it was going to be too big, too involved of an issue that I think I'm going to devote, um, give it its own lesson, if not a huge chunk of lesson next week. Um, and that is, uh, when uh, did Jesus die, or when did he eat the Passover meal? Before? Or, or let, me, let me back this up. Did, was Jesus crucified after the Passover meal or before the Passover meal? Because it says the Last Supper was the Passover meal, but then it says that he was crucified on the day of preparation for Passover. So which was it? Was he killed after Passover or was he killed before Passover? And it gets into a whole muddled mess about how the dating works and the rituals that the Jews observed and all kinds of things. And so I'll, I'll save that for a, a special presentation on its own it gets pretty pretty involved but but any, any, anything questions thoughts comments yeah a lot of burning daylight they're just spinning their wheels and, and, and it's interesting some of these i mean so some of these are things that's like i would be ashamed to present these as if they're some kind of serious thought. I mean, so some of them are just, all, some of them all it just takes is just some basic, you know, hey, let's look at it and what it says. And then it's obvious there's no contradiction. But yet you go on uh, skeptic websites and they'll have this list of, oh, here's all these errors in the Bible. And it has things like this where it's like, if you just spent about 30 seconds reading it, not nitpicking your favorite translation that you can, you know, twist, but actually just, just read what it says, you know, and it, 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 it's obvious. So. Um, what do you mean? Okay, there is, um, well, what's interesting, uh, uh, Bart Ehrman, the, the, the historian guy, this is one of the things that he actually mentions in his book. Um, he'll say that there's this evolution of Jesus because you go back to Mark and Jesus is, um, let me look at what the actual phrase is that he has. Um, yeah, it's Mark that says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which Mark is generally believed by most scholars to be the first gospel written. I favor Matthew, but it's not a big deal. Um, but John, being the later gospel that was written, he's the one that says, um, it is finished, right? Um, or no, he, uh, yeah, John's one that says it is finished. Um, Luke says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so the theory is, oh, you're seeing this progression of Jesus, Right, that it, Mark presents Jesus like, I don't know what's going on. Oh no, God, why are you forsaking me? You know, that he's confused and he's scared. But by John, it's like, oh, this is, you know, mighty, you know, God in flesh and everything. Actually, what's going on is if you stop and think the fact that our um, chapter numbers and verse numbers were added into our Bible about 700 years ago, I think. Um, the way you would identify where you were reading, a lot of times you would just quote a, a, a well-known part or beginning. In the same way that like our poetry, um, a lot of poems are just named. The title of the poem is just the first line, right? Well, 
So whenever Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People who knew their scripture would have immediately had Psalm 22 come to mind. Where Psalm 22 verse 1 starts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you read in that psalm, it goes on to describe in graphic detail the crucifixion and the scenario that played out around Jesus, where he says, dogs have surrounded me. Well, those are Gentiles. That's what Jews called, you know, non-Jewish people, right? A congregation of the wicked. That would refer to Jews who were unrighteous. So there's the Jewish leaders, unscrupulous and wicked hypocrites, having him crucified. And there's the Gentiles. It says, my hands and my feet are pierced. Right? I mean, you look in the details of what it's laying out in Psalm 22, match the crucifixion. And so people at that time having, you know, especially the Jewish leaders, I mean, they memorized their Old Testament. Right? We, we struggle with a few verses, right? They would memorize whole books of the Old Testament. And so whenever he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That would have brought to mind Psalm 22. And so he was actually making that connection to what Psalm 22 describes and what happened to him. So, it, yeah, it, it wasn't a moment of confusion and fear and panic. That, that, that wasn't what was going on. Good question. We got a little more time to kill. Way back to Simon, when he was selected to help Jesus carry the cross. Okay, Simon. Did the guards know Simon? They just ran or yanked him out? They probably just randomly yanked a guy out of the crowd. Okay. I mean, we got some excuse for him. Yeah. He might be the popular guy and everybody knew who was. Yeah, he, I mean, he may have become popular after the fact. You know, uh, so he's known in the church. But it, I mean, it was, it, I mean, it was a busy time in Jerusalem. And you remember, this is the neat thing. Um, there was a rule in place um, in Israel where a Roman soldier could ask a Jew, could just grab a Jew and say, here, carry this. And you had to walk with them. And it was actually being abused so much, they had to make the rule that, you know, a, a soldier could only make a, a, someone carry something a mile which is why whenever Jesus says, if someone asks you to walk a mile, walk two. Which is why that would have had such a severe impact on his audience whenever he said that. And so that's basically all this probably was, is they just said, hey, you guy, come here, you know, help him carry this. You know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and that very well could be how Rufus ended up being a Christian. Dad came home with a story, you know. And so, um, there we go. And what's interesting is, um, you know, a lot of the churches that are talked about in the Bible, we actually see them being planted. Uh, the church in Antioch wasn't something that one of the apostles planted. It was actually these other guys from Cyprus and Cyrene. It was Jews who were there in Jerusalem, who got converted, who then went somewhere else and started the church. It wasn't actually one of the apostles that were out there doing their missionary work. It was just the spread of the gospel. So. All right. Right. Um, according to Jewish reckoning, uh, the, uh, the, the day change was at sunset. So the Sabbath starts at sunset. Um, right, like, like, you know, um, according to Jews, was it like outside? We, we would already be in Thursday. Well, the... Well, now, now there, there, there's where the calendar shifts, but then there's how they count the time is a different, is a different issue. Um, because they also had, you know, like during the day, you had the hours, the first hour, the second hour, third hour. During the night, they had the watches of the night. And that would be from this time to that time, this time, you know, different way they divided that up. 
But as far as like, like the calendar day turned over at sunset, but as far as the way they would just keep track of, you know, the time of the day, make reference to, you know, the time of the day, that was started at, at sunrise. Right. Which is right there in keeping with the way Jews would keep their time. Whenever, you know, Genesis is saying there was evening and morning, you know, that, 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 that's just their way of keeping. The day started in the evening, you know, and then morning came and went on through the day. Um, and there's also, and this is one of those things that gets a little odd because we wouldn't talk that way. It actually seems kind of weird to us that why would you refer to a day like that? But that's, I mean, that is how they did it. Next week, we'll actually get into the idea, the, the issue. I'm not going to get into it now because that's next week. But how many days was Jesus in the tomb? Friday to Sunday, that's not three days. You know? And Right, right. Yeah, and, and different cultures throughout history have had different ways that they've tracked that and measured that and described that. And so and that's one of the hard things is, you know, us coming, whenever you're coming from your point of view with the way we do things with here's how our clock is done, here's how our calendar is done. And then we're reading back into something, an ancient culture that did it completely different, trying to scratch your head and go, okay, wait, no, wait, wait. okay, evening time. Okay. That's how, how are they tracking this? And then, you know, you can just drive yourself mad. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out because it's just not how we're used to thinking. It's so natural for us to think about here's how the days go. Here's how the time goes. And it's just how it is. And they did it completely different. So, <sighs> Okay. Then I guess we're done.